Uh, well, thank you folks for coming. It's a little bit like church here. Everybody sits in the back and you kind of have to draw them up front, right? So I, I guess instead I'll just move forward a little bit. Um, so uh, thank you very much for coming. And I want to point out that this uh, lecture that, I'm, uh, uh, that I'll do today is the third in a series. Uh, uh, Dr. Chow, Brian Chow, um, gave the second lecture earlier this year. Uh, and uh, Dr. Mulready Stone, Kristen Mulready Stone, did the first lecture uh, this year. So typically we do them all together at the same time. We just couldn't coordinate schedules uh, to be able to do it. So, um, so I am now the third and last of these uh, of these sort of organizing uh, lectures to help uh, sort of provide a framework for how to think about China. Um, Dr. Mulready Stone's lecture uh, focused on. Uh, sort of China's culture. Um, and uh, Dr. Chow focused, I think, on, mostly internally, China's economy and the politics of China's economy. And I'll be looking outward. Um, you'll see some overlap um, in our presentations, but I'll be looking at sort of how the Chinese think about security and economics outside of China and, and how that affects China's foreign policies um, in, in many different dimensions. Um, so um, the, the idea is that uh, Xi Jinping has to balance uh, various factors, right? So security, external security, um, wealth, the, the generation of national, national economy, and uh, hopefully increasing the GDP per capita over time. And then the third is, uh, is stability, right? So internal political stability. So uh, those are the things we'll focus on, but I should tell you who I am, I suppose. Um, my name is Peter Dutton. I am uh, now a professor in the Stockton Center of International Law. My background, I have both a law degree and a PhD. So I'm, uh, I focus on the intersection between uh, international law, China, and maritime strategy. So a lot of the work I've done has been on things like the South China Sea, the legal issues uh, there, and, and the relationship between the strategic and legal issues in the South China Sea and the East China Sea. Um, I started a, a more recently a project on Taiwan. Um, and so looking at the, at the, at the legal and strategic uh, and political aspects of that uh, dynamic. Um, prior to uh, my current position, I was uh, for a year and a half the interim dean of the Center for Naval Warfare Studies. Uh, before that, I, I was director of the Autonomy Maritime Studies Institute here at the college. Um, that's that's the short bio. Um, I've been I've actually been at the college for 22 years and, and held a bunch of different positions in that time. But uh, but that really gives you a sense of, of who I am and, and what I do. I like very much to teach. Um, I'm not teaching this year, but next year I'll, I'll be sure to uh, to get back into the classroom. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll join my Stockton colleagues whenever I can in, uh, in teaching their courses. All right, so um, security, wealth, and stability, I think are the three big things that Xi Jinping and the leaders of China have to, have to focus on. Um, and so one of the things about security is we think about um, external security sort of in, in the context of, of modern times, in the context of where China is today. And we forget that China actually thinks about security very differently. Um, so it's not just that China has a sort of a longer history than, than uh, places like the United States, but it, it, it has brought China's history of the last 200 years into the political conversation. Um, so there's very much an ideological component to the way China thinks about security, external security. And you have to think about the fact that from about the late 1700s until, until just about the turn of this century, right about uh, uh, 1989, really, I suppose. So for about 200 years, China was in some kind of internal uh, upheaval uh, uh, or external conflict, almost continually for 200 years. Um, so it began under, China had reached the apex of its power in the late 1700s. Um, it, was, it was unquestionably the most powerful country on the planet at that point in time. Um, it was a very continental state uh, at that time as well, and an expanding continental state uh, in the late 1700s. But with that expansion came in some internal weakness, right? Keeping up with uh, stability, internal stability, as it was expanding 
in a, in a continental direction became a very difficult thing to do in terms of resources. So internal instability began to creep in. There were cracks of in, internal instability and internal rebellions that began for various reasons in the late 1700s. And that sort of accelerated for various reasons into the 1800s when China began to fought, fight a series of wars, primarily with maritime powers. It was also, by, let's, let's be clear, it was also fighting a number of conflicts on its periphery with continental powers, um, but it was utterly unprepared to address maritime conflict, right? And so China lost all of the wars that were maritime focused from 1840 until the end of World War II. Um, and so uh, I, I suppose you could say that, that China was on the winning side in World War II, but that was because it was in a coalition uh, against Japan. So, uh, so China has, has and, and then what, what you have after World War II is, is revolution, right? So you have internal instability, just utter upheaval. Uh, and that really didn't end until after the Tiananmen incident in 1989, right? So you have essentially 200 years of internal and external instability. And the two are very related in, in the way China thinks about, uh, about security and stability. So um, in order to become more secure and internally stable, the Chinese turn to wealth generation, right? So you think about a communist party um, that is very uncommunist in its approach to, uh, to wealth generation. Uh, and so by, by the 1980s, actually Mao, Mao died in 1976, and um, as Deng Xiaoping ascended to power, um, he began to look at ways to generate wealth for China in order to generate both external security and internal stability. And, uh, and that's the purpose of wealth generation, fundamentally the purpose of wealth generation. It's less about, um, uh, I mean, it has the effect of making everybody's lives better, but it's less about that. That's not the fundamental purpose for it. So it's, it's about becoming more secure and more stable as a, as a country. So uh, the turning point, as, as I mentioned already, was that period of uh, 1989 to 1992, uh, after Tiananmen Square, um, uh, you know, the, the whole, as the, the essential concepts of communism and the ideological viewpoint of communism and revolution had run their course. They were no longer, uh, um, there was no longer a lot of appetite for revolution and communism after uh, the series of things like uh, the, the, the Great Leap Forward, where millions of Chinese died um, in order to pursue, frankly, some pretty bad policies in the 19, uh, early, uh, late 50s, early 60s. And then uh, there was the Cultural Revolution uh, in, the, in the 60s and early 70s, when, uh, again, millions of people died. And, and there was a suppression of, of any uh, sort of individual rights or freedom or individuality, even. Um, and then, uh, and then in 1989, you had a, another, um, you had another sort of incident, the Tiananmen Square incident, where uh, the Chinese Communist Party, uh, the, the the PLA, actually ended up uh, killing many uh, of the dissidents and the and the students in Tiananmen Square. We all we're all familiar with that. So you you had you got got to the point where the people in the party were really disconnected by that point in time, and so the party did a an incredible job of internal reassessment and, and developed a policy where um, Chinese Communist Party's legitimacy was based on three factors. It was based on generating wealth, right? So it was not, now here, there is an element of the bargain between the people and the party where generation of wealth was about uh, your life will get better. So the overarching purpose of generating wealth was to become more secure and stable, but also that stability component, internal political stability component, had to do with creating a relationship again between the party and the people that was beneficial to the people, right? And that the benefits were going to be uh, economic and, and uh, everybody's um, life would, would improve because their economic situation would improve. The second um, element of that relationship was based on uh, something called the uh, uh, patriotic education campaign. Essentially, it was the party. The party uh, built um, economic wealth for for the people, or would build it, and then at the same time built the nationalism. Sort of consciously created nationalism. And here's where that um, concept of the century of humiliation comes in to play. Right where consciously reminding the people from from you know, preschool up through PhD programs, everybody is 
participates in, in this uh, patriotic education campaign. And now, as you, you may have even read, even um, uh, uh, in, in companies, uh, even Western companies in China have these uh, education programs that they have to learn. And so you have a, a situation in which um, the Communist Party has consciously created a nationalist ideology for the people of, of, uh, of China that is based in part on humiliation, right? The past humiliations of that period of time in the 1800s and 1900s when China was weak and unstable and insecure. And, and, and demonstrating that the Chinese Communist Party can make China a whole again and strong again, right? So it's a, that, that relationship between the people and the party uh, that was consciously generated in part through wealth and in part through this uh, development of, of uh, nationalism. And the third aspect of it was called something called the three represents. And this is uh, where the party expanded. Instead of an internal, uh, what's called othering, right? You have, you have the ins and the outs, right? The good people and the bad people. That had been the revolutionary approach to uh, how to uh, solidify the control of the party. There's good people, they're the peasants, they're the workers, they're the communist party. And there's the bad people, the intellectuals, the artists, the capitalists, the landowners, right? That the exploiting class, right? So the, the good people and the bad people. Well, the party in, in that period of time between 1899 and realized that they were going to need um, all of these people in order to generate the wealth necessary to become more secure and more stable. And so they brought, the three represents is they brought everybody into the party. The problem then became what? If there's if there's something that's negative, if everybody is good in 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 terms of the party's perspective, then then there's no one to blame for the bad things, right? In the past, um, the blame would fall on the the the, the, the bad elements of society, right? Oh, it's the capitalists that are causing this problem and we need to rectify it by pure, you know, by, by punishing the capitalists. Now, China had to look for another way to, to place blame and it looked externally, right? So here you have a party that is all encompassing of Chinese people and that's good, right? It brings everybody into the party and it stabilizes the political, internal political situation. But in order to have um, someone to blame, let's put it that way, in order to have someone to blame, you have to have an external bad guy, right? And so um, what you saw at that point in time was a uh, beginning of the degradation of the relationship with Japan, right? Because Japan's the bad guy. Uh, Japan's the one that invaded us twice, right? And uh, you got to watch out for, for the Japanese and they're trying to take our islands, the Senkaku Jiao Islands, et cetera. Um, and so uh, that became one, and the other became the United States, actually. I mean, it just sort of varies, uh, depending on what the message is at the time. So um, China's foreign relations became different uh, after that point in time because of the internal situation. So what you see is a relationship between internal politics and externalization of the political approach to security and stability. So let's see. Xi Jinping, uh, he's of course the the top leader, and in order to um, in order to bring together these elements, right? He he has developed uh, the basic concepts that that he's laying out, right? So remain true to our original aspir aspiration uh, of socialism with Chinese characteristics, right? So socialism with Chinese characteristics is a new approach to economic relationships that combines socialism and elements of capitalism. Uh, uh, to create a moderately prosperous society in all respects, right? So everybody's going to be included in this larger uh, uh, effort. And then uh, to achieve the Chinese dream of national rejuvenation, right? So we're, we're looking back before the center of humiliation, attempting to recreate a powerful China with global impact and the capacity to, to manage affairs in East Asia without outside interference. Right? That's the, the essence of, of where Xi Jinping is trying to head. But he's got a dilemma, right? Because there's only so many resources and only so much that, uh, that, he, can, that he can put into these objectives. And so let me explain this a little bit. Um, so this is called the S-curve. Um, and it is a model for how states be, 
uh, become high GDP per capita states, essentially. And in the bottom left, you have a low G GDP per capita states. You see down there at the bottom, uh, Malawi, Mali, uh, Burundi, uh, states with a very low GDP per capita. In the upper right-hand corner, you have the United States, Switzerland, uh, uh, UAE, Qatar. So states with a very high GDP per capita. And uh, what you have is something uh, in the middle. So you have this initial increase when, when a state's economy begins to, to grow. A lot of that initial growth is based on external investment. That was part of what the, the Communist Party did to bring in external investment after 1990 and, and, uh, and begin to grow the economy with external investment. And you get easy, that sort of easy growth, right? Just based on a literate population, um, a, a, the capacity, the resources, the capacity to uh, become more productive uh, individually. So you're building productivity, increasing productivity in your society based on external capitalization. And so you can get that easy growth and that tends to be with manufacturing. Right, so low end manufacturing. Sometimes there's uh, uh, other approaches to it, like resource extraction. But generally speaking, it's it's low end uh, manufacturing, and you begin to, to rise in the S, and then you get to the point in the middle where you level off, and that's because of the, essentially the easy growth, the, the manufacturing growth, has been um, exhausted, and so it depends on the size of your economy. Uh, and the size of your population, um, how long that growth period will last. And because China's huge uh, and, and has a lot of resources, including pop, a strong population, um, it can, it, that, it'll last a long time. We saw it begin to level out around 2010, in that period of time. We saw a, a leveling off of the growth uh, uh, model into that, what's called the middle income trap. That middle box there in the S curve is the middle income trap. And states often get caught there because they're caught between um, the rising growth and then the headwinds that are caused by that rising growth. So some of that, some of those headwinds are demographic, right? How many workers per non-worker do you have, right? So the elderly and the young, the non-workers. Uh, when you when you end up with a, with a much older population, um, you have... Uh, more costs to bear with fewer workers. Right? So China has that problem. You also have rising expectations of a, of, a, of, a, of a middle class for a better life, better education system, better health system, cleaner environment. All these become headwinds to rising up to the, to the top level. But the biggest headwind has to do with the capacity to grow beyond manufacturing through things like uh, innovation or finance and investment, right? Uh, these these are the ways that you end up in the upper right hand corner. The sort of shorthand, the bumper sticker of it is the society has to get rich before it gets old, right? So the idea basically is you have to you have to have fewer headwinds, right? Than than uh, the the things that propel you into into wealth. So this is what Xi Jinping is trying to do. And he references the middle income trap. Some economists think this is nonsense. Um, I actually think it's it's a good model. But more important than that, Xi Jinping thinks it's a good model. He references the middle income trap all the time. And so he's thinking about how does China get out, get up into that upper quadrant where you, you have you know, a, a very large, more than a billion uh, population. Um, how, do you, how do you raise the GDP per capita of that population? Uh, and, and it's through innovation. It's through uh, finance, it's making money from money, right? So investment, looking, and, and that in, in part explains why China is looking outward in its investment approach. We'll come back and talk about that in a minute. But this is why China's in the middle income trap now. And it's why you've seen the GDP per capita and the, and the growth level level out over, over the last 10 years. A lot of what you've seen in growth over the last 10 or 15 years has been, has been uh, either debt-driven or external uh, investment driven, right? So a lot of that, that growth, you know, you can grow an economy if you keep borrowing, right? Uh, from, from the economy, but in the end, that's, that's not a sustainable approach. So China's at that point now where they're in that middle income trap, they're out of options for, for growing rapidly and they've got to figure out a way to get to the upper right-hand corner. Or expansion, right? So, so internal growth and and ways to to work externally to um, 
to, to build relationships where you can invest uh, effectively abroad um, has to be balanced against the expansion. Now, why? This should sound familiar to the to, to two of the legs of the, the, the post-1989 bargain with the people, right? The first is economic, raising, raising everyone's economic level as you raise the national wealth and that, that you can do more with, but at the same time, nationalism. Right. The other one is nationalism, and that is the Chinese Communist Party's drive to demonstrate efficacy, effectiveness in in uh, creating uh, a stronger China uh, uh, capable of achieving the China dream. And so there's a there's a pull and tug between investment in these two areas, economics and security, external uh, security, as the Chinese define it. So you see um, uh, Taiwan, you see the, the investment. It's an example of the investment in uh, in the military, in the PLA, um, uh, but you've got to figure out ways to invest in, in in providing nationalist benefits at the same time that you're providing economic benefits. So what kind of security does China want? Um, how does China think about its external security given these, these two competing interests? The first thing to say is that China looks at ex the external world as a land power. This is This is very important to understand. Um, and, and there's uh, two fundamental approaches to global security. One is an interior security strategy. The, the globe here shows, I think, a good example of it. Essentially, it's where you think of a bullseye and there's decreasing rings of control uh, around the bullseye, right? Decreasing rings of control. Um, and and uh, military capabilities that extend further out um, to expand the perimeter around that which you're trying to defend. That's an interior security strategy. Well, China has taken that approach um, to its, its overall security um, uh, where land dominates the sea, right? So yes, China is building a stronger and more capable Navy, but it is fundamentally up to this point using that Navy as a land power uses navies. Uh, which is to say to help expand the perimeter of control around the territory rather than to play the away game, essentially. I'll come back to that in just a minute. Um, so they're developing an expanding interior strategy, right? So, so I use the missile rings here as a way of, of demonstrating the concept, but China's incrementally expanding its capability outward. Initially, it was to, to protect the coast, then it was to protect the near seas. Then it was to move beyond the first island chain and to begin to affect uh, the in, and influence events in, in beyond the first island chain. Um, and, and the best way to think about it is in terms of control, influence, and reach. The Chinese don't use those terms exactly. Those are my terms. They use similar terms, though, that control is how the Chinese think about their maritime periphery. And, and it's not a set area. You, you might hear control within the first island chain, and that's a rough approach to it. But it's control as far out as the technology allows you to exercise sea supremacy, right? So, so control, then influence. The next is to influence the outcome of events. So you might think about that as um, uh, achieving the culminating point of enemy advance, right? In that second area, right? That might be the Philippine Sea or even, even a little bit farther from China's uh, uh, shores. And then the third is reach. Now, this is the, uh, the idea that China uses its fleet to go around the world, but at the sufferance of other stronger powers, right? China does not have bases. It doesn't have the capacity to project power and sustain power in, in, in conflict. If, for instance, China wanted to send aircraft carriers uh, into uh, the Eastern Mediterranean, it would only be able to do so if it was allowed by other stronger powers to do so. It could be prevented from doing that. That's what I mean by reach. China has the capacity to reach around the world with its Navy, but not to control events around the world with its Navy. So control is, is, is local, it's near seas. Um, influence is that next sort of second tier where they're trying to prevent an attack from reaching the zone of control, and then finally reach to achieve other events around the world or to achieve other interests around the world, uh, but not the capacity to control other areas of the maritime domain. Why? Because they use the land to control the sea. They have a, a land power, missile power, air power approach to, uh, to, to, to act with sea power. 
So sea power operates under the umbrella of land power um, in order to achieve the interior objectives. Now, the other approach to security strategy is an exterior security strategy. It's essentially the way the way it. It would be uh, to surround the bullseye, so to speak, right? So uh, the United States pursues an exterior security strategy through our relationships in Europe with NATO, our alliances in uh, East Asia. Uh, we're able to be resident in the areas of potential threat um, and to control the commons in between our territory and that, that area. That's called an exterior security strategy. You're essentially trying to surround the potential uh, area of hostility. So, um, and so you can see in that um, a, a fundamental clash of, of basic security strategies between an expanding interior, where China is attempting to achieve more and more control over space in East Asia, um, and the United States, which has historically been resident in East Asia to prevent another country from achieving control over that space. The United States has never, uh, the design of the United States was never to, to be the hegemon, the sole power in East Asia, although there were times when we were. Um, that's not the design. The design is to prevent someone else from becoming the sole uh, dominant power in, in that region. So, um, so you can see where some of the clash between the American interests and the Chinese interests uh, overlap. We have vital national interests in the same geographic space, is how I like to put it, because China's an expanding interior power and the United States is a resident exterior power. So when China looks out at the world, this is basically what, what China sees. So China sees um, the American position in Japan, China sees the American position in the Philippines. China sees the American uh, uh, support for Taiwan, right? So China looks out at the world and sees uh, sees the American position there. But but now what we what we see is China weakening um, the American position and the American alliances. The red lines there um, are the uh, the ways in which China is demonstrating the capacity to undermine the security of the United States position in the region as the as the exterior power allied with regional maritime interests. If you think about it, um, I don't think I have the map. I should have done that too. Um, I, I, if you think about the map of China, you can think about the in the upper right hand corner, northeast corner is Manchuria. Then there's Mongolia. Mongolia, as a state today, was actually part of historically part of China during the Qing Dynasty. Um, but there, even part of Mongolia, um, Outer Mongolia, it's called, is uh, no Inner Mongolia. Sorry, is part of is part of uh, China today. Then Xinjiang. Uh, the the Turkish uh, Turkmenistan uh, no Turkestan I can't remember East Turkestan that's what it was called um, the the Turkic area um, uh, uh, was brought into the Chinese dynasty during the uh, Qing dynasty and the same thing with Tibet so you have this this uh, arc of control uh, that was was completed around China during the Qing dynasty, right? That period of time in, in the late 1700s when China was at its most powerful is when China, China brought into the imperial system these external uh, territories. Uh, it's part of the internal weakness that they have to deal with today, that China, China remains an imperial system. Uh, there's uh, uh, historical conquering of these lands, but they were brought into the imperial system in order to provide a buffer zone, right? To, to provide stability on, on historical China's borders, the Han Chinese border. But, but the Qing failed to provide that same uh, stability in the maritime periphery. And you can see what the Chinese are trying to do today. It's to complete that arc of, of, of security around central China by including the maritime domain in that larger security system. So are they looking to expand uh, further in order to generate more uh, security for their economic system as it's developing? Yes, they are. They're probing for opportunities for overseas bases. Um, to, to date, the only place, uh, Cambodia uh, in, in, and Djibouti, they, those are the only two places. Um, Djibouti, they for sure have one already. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that in, in, in just a minute. Um, uh, and and they're, they seem to be developing one in uh, in Cambodia. It's pretty clear that that's what's what's going on there. 
Um, the one in, uh, neither one, frankly, provides a, a, a great benefit to the Chinese. Um, Cambodia, the base in Cambodia, I think is just an opportunity. Uh, it does push a bit to the Southwest, uh, China's ability to uh, station maritime uh, forces. Um, but recall that they've got the, the three large bases and five small bases among the Spratly Islands. Um, so this probably doesn't tremendously shift uh, the strategic posture for the Chinese. And remember too, that this is within the South China Sea, right? So again, it doesn't uh, tremendously shift the posture. What does it do? It, it fundamentally surrounds Vietnam. Uh, it changes the dynamic of the South China Sea. It creates, um, uh, you know, China has uh, is on uh, Vietnam's northern border. Uh, China and Vietnam contest the islands in the South China Sea, and now China has a uh, position in the, uh, in Cambodia, and so it changes the security dynamic for Vietnam in ways that may, I think, China hopes uh, favor its interests. It also um, uh, provides the opportunity for more naval uh, power to be in the vicinity of the. Um, Indonesian Straits, Strait of Malacca, and the and the other straits through the Indonesian archipelago. So, uh, but I don't think it changes things dramatically. I also think the same thing about Djibouti. Um, it's it's um, it has not turned into the kind of forward operating base that I think the Chinese hoped it might uh, do. But at the same time, in times of conflict, remember China does not have the capacity to defend its interests abroad. Right, in times of conflict. What does this base become? It's a disconnected, it's untethered from China's security system and easily severed by other maritime powers in the region, India, Australia, perhaps the United States, et cetera. Um, France actually has, has uh, uh, interests in the region as well. So you have other powers that, that might have the capacity to rather easily sever China's connection to Djibouti should they desire to do it. So they're probing for opportunity, but they really haven't turned that corner yet. And I do wonder whether uh, whether China will in fact turn the corner into something of a more expeditionary naval force with the capacity to control uh, regional events because they have bases in the region that support the naval power and each other in that region. So I'm not convinced uh, based on the evidence to date that China um, uh, has that capacity, uh, despite what you read uh, from some people about China's Navy is going global. Yes, it's true, but China's Navy is only glo going global at the at the sufferance of other states. Okay, so in the in the Indian Ocean, uh, China has interests, right? Uh, supply chain interests that uh, both resources and energy and markets that run across this, and you would expect. Uh, that China would look for an opportunity to connect those um, with its South China Sea bases, including uh, in, in apparently uh, Cambodia, um, and, but they would need a node in the middle. So you would be looking at say, perhaps uh, Sri Lanka, perhaps the Maldives, perhaps Seychelles, who knows, um, that if China is going to attempt to make this leap to um, to be able to dominate their, their uh, East-West supply chains, uh, and sea lines of communication, you would expect to see some more uh, uh, development in, in that area. You might also expect to see it in, say, Pakistan, Guadar there, or, or in uh, Myanmar. To date, those, those, there's been talk for more than 20 years now about the possibility of a string of pearls bases or, or uh, bases um, you know, in the Indian Ocean region. And for various reasons, and I think one of them is the cost, both political and economic, cost of bases, China has chosen not, not to pursue it as avidly as they might. Um, so what kind of Navy does China want then? Um, I think there's, uh, first, remember, I think the key to remember is Taiwan first, right? So keeping pressure on Taiwan, a force structure developed to put pressure on Taiwan and, uh, and, to, and to focus on that as a source of, remember that nationalism uh, and that, that uh, desire to make China quote whole, right? By bringing these uh, territories back under uh, uh, Beijing's dominance. Um, that's the first priority. It remains the first priority for, for Xi Jinping and, and the Chinese Communist Party. And what would we be looking for to see if there's going to be change? Well, I developed this five 
the, the latter of, of five different types of bases, beginning at the bottom and, and, and going up to the top. And what you would expect to see would be China looking for overseas naval bases that work their way up, up this ladder. Um, at the bottom is really just a friendly port, right? Where uh, ships, uh, if, you, if you're from the Navy or, or uh, Naval, um, you know that ships pull into ports all the time. They, they are looking for ways for, uh, to, to rest and replenish and, uh, and, and conduct naval diplomacy, right? So you're out and about and, and conducting national and naval diplomacy. These are just friendly ports, right? Just permission to, to come into a, a foreign port. And China has plenty of these on a worldwide basis. And that's typical of, of, of all navies. Um, moving up one, you have bases where there's logistic support. There might be um, ongoing commercial ties. You use perhaps the same port over and over again. And so you develop commercial ties and have contractual uh, logistics relationships. China had one of these. It was in the port of Aden uh, prior to the just prior to the essential collapse of, of Yemen uh, into civil war. So China used the port of Aden on a regular basis in, in, this, in this way. They had ongoing logistic support contracts and they, they had developed a sort of a routine relationship with, uh, with, with um, commercial support in that, in that port. Next up, you would see uh, on the third rung of the ladder, you would see um, a logistics hub where you have a permanent contractual relationship where rather than sort of ad hoc contractual relationships, you have a permanent contractual relationship. That's not just economic, but political as well. The example that I use for this would be someplace like um, uh, Jebel Ali, for instance, in Dubai. You have, uh, it's not a base per se, but it is a permanent contractual relationship between uh, the UAE and the United States to use Jebel Ali and the peers there for support. And there's a carrier pier where we come and go on a, on a routine basis and and there's existing contractual relationships that have a political component behind them right so that's an example of that third level up fourth level up um i just refer to it as a place right this is we talk a lot about uh navies having places not just bases and the idea is we have a permanent presence with political commitment that's the key you might think of this as uh, perhaps Singapore, right? The U.S. has a has a permanent logistics uh, uh, support system uh, and permanent uh, agreement with the government of Singapore to use Changi um, and to the the, the peers at Changi and to um, and so there's what you see as you're going up the ladder is a shift from a, a sort of commercial ad hoc relationship to a a more politically permanent relationship. Right, and so as you go higher up, it, it, it there's a there's a uh, international diplomacy aspect to the relationship that increases in intensity, um, and so at the place level, you have a permanent relationship with the other country. It may not be a defense agreement; uh, it may be just a status of forces agreement where you're allowed to to use permanently uh, a facility and even to have like in in. Uh, in Singapore, a permanent logistics uh, hub, um, but it's based on that political level of commitment. And then finally, you have a base, a full-on base, something like the American naval base in Yokosuka, Japan, uh, where it's based on a deep political commitment between the two countries. There's a permanent presence. There's the capacity to work well together uh, on security issues, um, often as allies, um, and there's full, uh, all of the support that, that, I mean, the very extensive support that navies need to support each other. And it's that level of base that clearly China does not have anywhere in the world. So we might be seeing something like it be beginning to develop with Cambodia. It's unclear exactly how high on the ladder that will go. But even in Djibouti, um, you have something maybe approaching that level of place, somewhere between uh, a logistics hub and place, um, but definitely not at that top level of political commitment where uh, Djibouti and China are now allies supporting each other, right? So that's, that's as you would look uh, for a 
um, a change in China's approach to its security interests, where it intends to move beyond a regional power into a uh, more expansionary naval power that will intend probably probably as a next stage, the logical next stage would be to develop uh, naval power in the Indian Ocean. Um, but there's a lot of pushback from, from others, uh, United States, Australia, India, and others uh, to, to doing that. So there's, a, there's costs for China to doing it. And they don't seem to be willing to pay those costs, at least not yet. So um, uh, the, the key there is the political relationships. China is also reluctant to develop um, uh, political relationships in the same way that the United States and others have, um, where China is committed to supporting uh, the security interests of other states, right? Uh, China does not feel the confidence. Uh, it doesn't feel like it has the resources to do that while it hasn't met its own uh, interests at this time. Okay, along with this, so uh, remember I talked about the expanding interior power and the and the forward-based exterior power. Um, that affects um, how the U.S. and China view international law of the sea, right? So you can see, first of all, um, in, in China's view, um, maritime order is based entirely on national interests, entirely on national interests, without necessarily reference to global interests and how national interests and global interests are related. In fact, it's quite the opposite. In my engagement with the Chinese, they're very focused only on what China wants in its in its regional neighborhood. And when you when you press them and say, "Well, are you willing to live in a world where others start following your your, your rules and start uh, attempting to take over large areas of, of water space and make it their own?" Uh, uh, there's not any response to that, right? So at this point, China's policies are purely national in focus without reference to any um, aspect on uh, of how China's policies will affect um, the global maritime rules-based system. Remember, as we, we all, I'm sure, remind the Chinese when we see them, that China's a growing power and, and uh, others will take, will follow China's lead. Um, China's, because of China's power, others will follow its, its lead eventually. And so, uh, challenging the Chinese on whether they want to live in a world where their rules now apply more broadly uh, has been has been a uh, an ongoing conversation that I've had with the Chinese. Um, on the on the left, you see what um, uh, what the South China Sea would look like um, if the rules of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea were followed. So what you have uh, on the left here are um, the exclusive economic zones in the blue dashed lines of the coastal states. Um, the, the red dashed line is China's nine dashed line uh, claim, the broader claim, without reference. It, it is without reference to uh, existing international law. On the right, what you have is um, what I call the inside out, outside in, uh, China's approach to making its claim. Um, the inside out approach is saying, hey, we have historic rights based on this nine dash line. We inherited the nine dash line from the Republic of China. We have rights based on it. Uh, and, and, and those are historic rights to the water space and to the land within it. Um, they haven't fully clarified what those uh, uh, historic rights are. Um, but what they've also done, so that's the outside in, right? You're claiming the, the water space based on that outside line, the nine dash line and everything inside it based on the line and historic rights. Remember that there is no reference in international law to that approach at all. Um, the inside out approach is to say, okay, um, well, all of the islands in the South China Sea belong to China. We claim them, we, we, we possess them and the rest of the countries that occupy them do so because we're benevolent. Right, so uh, we're not willing to use force to extricate them. So, uh, but the Chinese say we own them; they're ours, and we are going to uh, draw baselines around the island groups, uh, meaning collectively collect the island groups, draw draw lines around them, and draw our resource zones from that collected point. Well, again, that's not what international law allows. Period. You can't draw uh, uh, baselines around widely dispersed tiny little islands, essentially enclosing 98% uh, uh, water and 2% land uh, and, and claiming it as your sovereign 
zone. That's just not what international law allows. But you see an example of that on the on the right there. Um, now, this is notional. The Chinese haven't told us exactly what their baselines would look like, but this is about right. I've participated in enough uh, discussions with the Chinese to know that this is roughly what the Chinese are talking about. Um, and so what you can see is that they, uh, they collectivize the islands and then draw the exclusive economic zone from that. Um, and that, that takes you essentially uh, throughout the entire South China Sea. And, and when you talk to the Chinese about what that now the nine dash line means in this case, they say, well, that's the medium line between our claim and the coastline of other states. And that's our basic uh, negotiating position about the nine dash line. So in, in, whether you get there from the outside in, in other words, the line is ours, everything in it's ours based on historic rights or the inside out, that's using the language of the law, but not the law, right? Uh, baselines and, and territorial seas and exclusive economic zones uses the language of the law, but it's not applying the law in how that's actually uh, achieved to dominate space. So uh, these are the, the ways in which China is undermining the uh, maritime rules-based order um, and with, without reference to how that might affect the global rules-based order in the maritime domain. Um, and so, so it's very interesting that China hasn't made that shift from uh, looking at itself as a global leader based on the power that it has achieved through the wealth it's been able to generate. Um, it hasn't made that shift from from narrow national interests to sort of enlightened national interests in the context of global power. It just hasn't made that shift yet. So uh, it still remains a continental state focused on Taiwan and controlling its, uh, its regional space. So that's the kind of maritime order that, that China wants. It does want to avoid provoking conflict. Right, so it desires to it desires expansion in the maritime domain, maritime direction, without escalation, without uh, reaching um, uh, military conflict. So its policy remains to seek a reunion with uh, with Taiwan through peaceful means, even as it's building military power and demonstrating the capacity to use military power. There's a coercive element to it, uh, but its policy remains. First, to, to achieve it through peaceful means, an only uh, use of force and last resort. But in the in the East China Sea and the South China Sea, China has uh, uh, been much more proactive in using um, non-military power. So non-militarized coercion is how the phrase I use for this. Non-militarized coercion to uh, to achieve control over this, this expanded maritime periphery. That, that is uh, claiming for itself. Um, it's also doing a little bit of violence to, uh, to the concept of use of force in international law and in the international system, because it's, it's essentially defining anything that is um, a law enforcement platform is, is, by China's view, by definition, not a use of force. So uh, a, a Coast Guard vessel or a maritime militia vessel might plow right through a uh, Philippine uh, vessel and, and sink it, as it has done, uh, as they have done, but that's not a use of force because it was done with a Coast Guard vessel or a, um, a, a mil militia vessel. So these are considered below the threshold of Article 2.4 of the UN Charter, um, and not invoking Article 57, right? So the, the uh, right of, of self-defense. So Article 52, sorry, Article 52, right of self-defense. Yeah. If you want, if you want. Thank you. Uh, Ron, I, I'm getting all my 50s next time. Article 51, right of self-defense. Thank you. Um, so uh, getting those, uh, uh, get, sort of blurring the, the paradigm there and blurring the, um, uh, the, the approach to use of force. They are, um, they're attempting to uh, expand without provoking escalation. This is part of what the gray zone means, essentially, part of it. All right, so what kind of economic order does China want, right? Well, so we've heard quite a bit about the expansion recently of the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, bringing new members. I think Iran and Saudi Arabia both recently uh, uh, were brought within uh, a number of different China's uh, Chinese um, uh, 
breaks, but also the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, so China's looking at ways to, uh, to connect its economic power to global uh, uh, to the global market for the purpose, for in part for the purpose of expanding its economic relationships and its economic activities, but for a very important component uh, being to expand its uh, political power through the economic relationships. And China has been fairly effective in being able to use economic power to uh, achieve political outcomes uh, to, to date. So what is the Belt and Road Initiative? In short, it's offshoring manufacturing. Remember, China's got the, uh, it, it's essentially used up low end manufacturing capability. And now, frankly, wages in China have begun to uh, make low end manufacturing in China less competitive. And so China itself has begun offshoring some of that uh, to, to other places. Ethiopia was a key uh, place that China uh, offshored this to and before it devolved into civil war. China's been unlucky in that regard. Developing markets for its products. A lot of uh, what China's doing in Africa has to do with developing markets and setting the rules of the structure and the relationships to, uh, to, to use these markets for the long term. Um, access and resources uh, also in Africa, but, but elsewhere as well. But a lot of the focus is on Africa. Building infrastructure in, uh, you know, throughout the world, frankly. Um, uh, establishing rules re in relationship to this. And this isn't just international law. These are things like business standards or, or uh, manufacturing standards. There's all kinds of things that make Chinese products more globally uh, essential to the supply chain through things like standards uh, and, and not just the, uh, the rules uh, of um, economic relationship, although they are attempting to establish rules of, rec of economic relationship that favor Chinese interests as well. And then creating long-term relationships, right? So that, that China has uh, is looking for ways to expand its global power, not so much through military power, as we've seen, but through its, its use of economic relate, uh, relationships for political power. Long-standing relationships in, in Africa. Um, long, China has had a long history of engaging with, uh, uh, from the 1950s through 60s and 70s, China was actively involved in, uh, welcoming and assisting states that were emerging. So whether that was out of colonialism or, or emerging in, as, as new states uh, during that period of time, um, China uh, exercised a lot of leadership and still considers itself leading the leading state of developing states in, in the world. Um, uh, I think we've hit enough there. The economic prize uh, for China is Europe. Right, the European market, it's even bigger than the American market. Um, it is um, a challenging market <laughs> uh, because there's both a combination of, of uh, state-based national uh, standards and then EU uh, standards. But China is really looking to um, leverage its economic power in Europe for the same reason, because it wants uh, not just to have that market uh, uh, drawn to the Chinese economy, but also to have political leverage there and to weaken American political leverage uh, in, in Europe that has been developed you know, over, over the last couple of centuries. Uh, we've already mentioned the headwinds that China faces in developing its wealth um, uh, and what it's doing to try to uh, advance its interests there. So maintaining power uh, is the internal stabilization um, that, um, that China is attempting to, that the Chinese Communist Party is attempting to do through its policies of, um, of internal security, um, uh, wealth generation, and external security, so stability, security, and, uh, and wealth uh, together, um, maintaining uh, Chinese Communist power, but also sustaining China's overall rise within the international system. So what thoughts or questions do you have? Yeah. So relating to the S curve, yep. I noticed that the dates on there were quite old. Yep. Where would it place China Same. currently? It's right in the same position. Yeah, it's a GDP per capita thing. China's GDP per capita hasn't changed much. Got it. Thank yeah. You. It's just the only one that I could find. <laughs> it was from the economist actually some time ago. Yep. So yep. Uh, so the, there are a lot of internal conflicts which are at presently going on in the China, like the UK and the other states. Mm -hmm. 
how is that affecting his expansionist policy or the sustaining policy for the rise? Uh, so China has a pretty good internal control system, I think. Uh, occasionally you see um, uh, commentators um, predicting China's collapse in various ways because of these internal challenges that China faces, debt being one of them, but also internal dissent uh, being another. Um, but China has uh, uh, very effectively developed since, since 1989, has developed an internal control system um, that... Uh, uh, it is largely economic, uh, I'm sorry, largely um, cyber-based and economic-based, right? So the capacity to use cyber capabilities to control the population uh, and, and, and communication among people, um, and then to uh, even control access to resources um, through uh, cyber, various cyber control mechanisms. There's almost no cash used in China anymore. Um, all trans, nearly all transactions are, um, are through are through apps on uh, on the phone that are actually very carefully controlled and monitored by the Chinese government. And then, of course, they have the external security system. You know, um, people are monitored incredibly uh, in 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 China. So I think what the what the Chinese Communist Party has done to maintain internal stability and and the security of the party um, has been to recognize that there is um, that they would have to give up a certain amount of control. Uh, internal control, but that they re uh, uh, replace that control with the monitoring and a monitoring system, so that they could zero in on potential threats, cut them out before they uh, they became too serious. That's my view, at least. Did that answer your question? Or yeah. okay, yeah. You think about Stalin, how starkly he was dangerous to Soviet communism of of external power. And you said China needs that external opponent. But it doesn't seem as if China uses the United States in the same way that, that Stalin did. Sometimes they present it more like the United States is annoying. Yeah. It's, it's so can you characterize the difference in in the need for this external opponent? Yeah, I'm not sure I can do a good compare and contrast with the Soviet Union and Stalin, but I can I can say that. Um, the Chinese relationship with the United States is, is complex, right? Because the Chinese need the American economy um, every bit as much as they are seeking the same level of, of interest in the, in the uh, European economy. So you, you, know, you have to be careful not to overdo the, the, the political uh, uh, condemnation. Um, but there's a pretty steady drumbeat uh, internal to the Chinese conversation about negative aspects of the relationship with the United States and the American provocation of China in various ways. Things that, frankly, they just don't even have to have to um, highlight at all. For instance, uh, American intelligence gathering from the airspace outside of China is an example that um, the Chinese use all the time uh, to uh, sort of highlight the uh, American pressure on China. They could just ignore it entirely. People, people might know or might not know or or care, but the Chinese focus on it as a way of, of generating sort of uh, a sense of anger at the United States for interfering in China's overall regional security. Um, uh, and it's somewhat manufactured, you can, you can see it. Um, but you're right, it is a complex relationship. They can't take it too far, right? Because they they need the American investment and, and, and relationship with the American markets as well. Soviet Union was pretty different. It was it was economically isolated. They didn't need us, right? right. So, um, not not in the same way. Um, so I, I think that might help explain some of the difference. But I don't know if there's a Soviet expert in the room who can clarify some of that. But all right, Nina. Um I'm wondering how much in uh, in your research you're coming into contact with um, China's work in emerging tech. So I know in, in a lot of this um, sort of expansion of its military power, a big part of a big component of that is uh, developing uh, new capabilities and especially around AI, which of course I focus on, but but I'm thinking also in terms of quantum um, technologies is what yeah. I think they're quite advanced. Um, how much is this coming into contact with some of the maritime strategy uh, stuff that you're yeah. on? So um, I would say a lot, okay. actually. There's, um, 
it's not an area of focus for my research up to date, especially for structure and technology issues. I, but anyone who studies China bumps up against these issues all the time. Um, and the degree, the degree to which China is really rapidly seeking to advance its, its uh, capabilities in these emerging technologies, um, part of this has to do with, uh, with security, but part of it also has to do with getting in that upper right-hand quadrant of the S-curve, right? It's, it's, it's how you innovate to uh, take advantage of the next revolution, right? So, um, you know, 20 years ago, it was, it was Apple and the iPhone. And, you know, I don't know what the next innovation might be, but China is, is seeking to position itself within these technology advances um, to, be, to be at the forefront of it. And they are also, um, <clears throat> they are also bringing some of these technologies into the military field. I, I think the leading edge of it is, is pretty, you know, classified, just exactly what the Chinese are doing. But every year when the annual China Power Report comes out uh, from, from DOD, you learn new things about what the, what the Chinese are doing at an unclassified level that just is stunning, right? So space technology, I think, is a real area of, of expansion and the, ca the capacity to communicate um, with space. I've only dabbled in learning about this quantum computing and, uh, and uh, uh, what's that? There's, there's a couple of different uh, uh, phrases related to that that are not coming to my mind at the moment, but the capacity to, um, uh, the, is it quantum communications? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the quantum communications as well is something that I've seen that the Chinese are uh, seeking to, to position themselves at the forefront of. I'll be honest, I don't understand the technology well, but um, it, it does give me real pause and concern to see how fast China is developing this capability. Uh, do you have anything else to add? I mean, what, what are you seeing in your work? Yeah, so I think what, I, what I'm seeing, and because you know my, my work is on emerging tech, so, so I'm really coming at it from that angle, but, but a lot of what I'm seeing, especially around quantum um, stuff, is China's had a, a few um, impressive breakthroughs yeah. uh, with computing, but also with cryptography, I believe, um, was one of the ones I saw recently. Um, and, and the discussions that's happening in the tech space around this is whether China's kind of trying to redefine what military influence looks like. So maybe it doesn't have to resemble the way the U.S. has spread its its military influence around the globe. It's going to be right. something new, right? And, and something yeah. technology-based. So I just didn't know if this was... Uh, but but the, the maritime angle is one that I'm not familiar with it all. So I was wondering if that come up. You know, it brings to mind the last uh, defense white paper that the Chinese, um, that the Chinese developed. Uh, I don't recall the year, 2013, maybe, uh, maybe someone knows, but it's been a while. Um, the last defense white paper, when, I, when it came out, I took the white paper and I took two markers, literally, and I went through line by line and all of the maritime stuff I I highlighted it on blue or something, right? So, but then there was what I noticed, and, and this was what everyone was focused on, because because there was a real sense that China's maritime policies had turned a corner. Like, and, and especially with with the Navy, there was this sort of like, whoa, what what does this really mean for us, right? Um, moment when China's white paper came out, because there was so much naval stuff in it. Um, but I took another marker, say yellow, and went through it and marked up all of the um, the, the, the references to, to new technologies and new domains, right? And what you ended up with was a document that was equally blue and yellow, right? And so what I think what we were seeing was an investment in two different approaches to expanding global power. And my sense is that they have limited what they've invested in the Navy power. Right, the, the the Navy as an expansionary tool, right, um, and and that they have focused on technology, uh, emerging technologies and emerging domains as the expansionary tool. I also came across a couple of really interesting Chinese papers about the way in which technology could be employed, um, and uh, one of them, uh, in particular, by a very influential. Uh, Chinese writer from a very influential think tank at the National Defense University wrote about leapfrogging over naval power, 
like that naval power was so 19th century, right? So um, the idea that naval power is no longer the primary mechanism or the most effective mechanism of power projection for states, that power projection through, um, actually the paper was about space technology, power projection through space technology uh, as a mechanism for global maneuver and the capacity to mass power and globally maneuver through space, as opposed to in the maritime domain, could be achieved more effectively and efficiently. Right. That's so. So those two things really struck me, um, and I, I, I just haven't had the capacity to to pull on the threads of the of the different programs. But um, it did strike me to see that the, the Chinese probably have seen more breakthroughs in the emerging domains, the cyber, the space, um, and they, they, they actually have um, uh, uh, more domains than we do in mil military domains. So land, sea, air, uh, space, and cyber are the are sort of the American domains. They include the electromagnetic domain and the, and the cognitive domain. They have, they have two different additional domains um, that they see as, as sort of warfare domains. Um, and so it's the emerging domains, like the, the space, the cyber, the electromagnetic, and the cognitive domain that they have been focusing uh, on how to project power and achieve strategic effects that way. Um, that, that's what I observed. I, I, I don't know. It's really interesting. You know, maybe someday we'll be studying China's naval power as, um, uh, you know, a, a competitive strategy. Um, you know, a Chinese competitive strategy, develop a Navy to keep the Americans worried about the Navy and then develop these other domains as the as the primary effort. I don't I don't know. We shall see. Yeah. What else? Anything? Julia, is there anybody uh, on Zoom that has a question? All right. I don't know if Julia's even there. <laughs> Um, hey, thanks for coming. Uh, I really appreciate it, and I, I hope you got something out of it. I enjoyed chatting with you. Thank you.